a young association. We celebrated our fifth anniversary last year. And our motto has been to preserve and to present. We were looking forward to our next five years uh, doing a strategic plan. And the Wilson Foundation contacted us and said they'd like to gift us a million dollars immediately as an endowment. And if we uh, were successful in raising a million on our own, they'd increase that by another million, so that would be three million in total. And we've got three months to go, so the pressure's on, but we are 50% uh, of the way there, and we're caught, Mark Bottom, our Secretary of Treasurer and I, are confident we're going to make that goal. And uh, I, if you want to join our association, contribute money, that would be welcome. <laughs> Um, and you can spread the gift over three to five years. <laughs> we, we, we changed as a result of the strategy process in this funding the model from to preserve and to present, to preserve, to present, and to engage. Because we think there is a need not only for the engagement of Canadians in, 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 history, in their own history, but business, which accounts for so much of the history of the country, is t almost totally neglected in the uh, in the classroom. Harrison Kennedy, uh, who was sitting back there, and I were working on the Canadian Bank Act last year because it was the 150th anniversary, and we took texts from 1920 to the present, and almost no reference to this extraordinarily important piece of legislation. Um, I'd like you to know that in addition to Mark and myself, we have three other board members. Mark Salmon from uh, Ottawa, who was with Library Archives Canada, and uh, Tabitha, who you got the way in, and Juan is still in the back. So we've got a, we, you can see that, well, we've got an age issue, at least the guy is as old as me, but we've talked about the bright young people coming along. Um, and uh, next, I will say briefly about the Albany Public Trial because this is the public being in this location since 1898 and was founded in 1882. One thing I'd like to mention to you I often read in the press that we have John A. McDonald's bar bills hanging on the floor. <laughs> That's right over there. Those are not bar bills, those are his annual dues that he paid promptly. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, those of us who are business historians are grateful that Sir John A. Macdonald was Prime Minister in 1871, so we got the Bank Act we did rather than the Bank Act that was proposed in 1869. Uh, excuse me. Now, uh, I mentioned that I was co-author of the book. The, the other co-author was Chris Colbrat, an extraordinary individual, American by birth, but he taught a great deal in Europe, particularly in Paris. He knew the German banking system very, very well. Unfortunately, in January 2017, before we were had second round reviews, Chris died unexpectedly from a heart attack. But it was his, the book was his idea, and the idea of a Canadian Business History Association was his idea. And I think even though he was American, he'd spent so much time in, in Europe, and he saw there that the Chambers of Commerce in particular had worked to organize something similar to a Business History Association. And that's where we got many of our ideas. Uh, so, uh, to tell you briefly the story of how a book became a documentary and then was accepted, accepted by 85% of the PBS network, I have three panelists and I'm going to introduce them one at a time, they'll say a few words and I'm not going to introduce all three at once. The first I want to introduce is uh, Jennifer D. Domanicu. 
and she is business and economics editor and manager of social sciences acquisition. Chris and I met her a decade ago. She guided us to completion in 2018. And we also have with us Chris Reed, the publicist, and Lynn Fisher, the vice president of programming. Jennifer? It's uh, really a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, again, we met so long ago to talk about the idea for what became from Wall Street to Bay Street. It began just with a book proposal, like many books do. Um, and from the beginning, I was just so impressed with um, both Joe and, and the late uh, Chris Colbert, their passion for the project. They really believed in the story that they wanted to tell about the difference in the evolution of these two financial systems and believed that through learning about business history and how these institutions were created, how that could inform not only um, business people, but young people. And I know that the book is dedicated to their students. And I think it's that audience that they really had in mind um, when they wrote this book. Um, and certainly, um, it is sold extremely well. I think you know people, maybe in the past, weren't looking to Canada as a comparator. Um, but um, the way we weathered the financial crisis and our institutions, and now even today, I think more and more people are looking to the example of Canada. So we're so proud at University of Toronto Press to have this book um, as part of our business imprint, which is in partnership with the Rotman School. So we're dedicated to publishing books that help inform the general public um, about business issues, and I'm really thankful to have business history um, as part of that portfolio. And congratulations as well on this new edition, um, which is beautiful. It's a beautiful book. Um, and we hope that we'll see even more translations and editions around the world as well. So congratulations. Jim. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. And 
you know, we would meet for coffee or we'd meet for lunch, and he would breathe new life into what I, you know, unwisely deemed as unexciting history previously. <laughs> <laughs> He would talk about it with such reverence and such excitement that you felt like you were getting a first-hand account of it, and I, you know, it was infectious. So when he told me about his new book, you know, he told me about this dynamic, you know, amazing Canadian success story that focused around banking. Well, I didn't know anything about banking at all. I didn't even really know much about my own personal banking. <laughs> but I was intrigued about it, and he kind of, um, you know, he gave me the book, and I, well, he made me buy the book, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I bought the book, he autographed, I read it, and I was more and more interested in it, and he would tell me more and more adamantly about it, and then, you know, interest became inspiration. And I really started thinking about it. Because it wasn't only a history, and this, and this film is not only just a history uh, account. Like, sure, it goes over, the, you know, the history of banking in North America, but it's also really about how our system today operates and how banking in North America operates in terms of security and in terms of risk and how that history dictates that. It's amazing to go all the way back to, you know, the start of it with Alexander Hamilton and then follow the evolution through, through all of the crises, all of the depressions, wars, busts, innovative thinkers, creative ideas, you know, good, terrible ideas, and you end up getting hammered out what our system is today. To see the genius of an Alexander Hamilton reverberate his ideas throughout history to something like the crisis of 2008, in the modern day that has kind of affected everyone or something like that is, well, I think that's very compelling. And so it was really a pleasure at, for me as a filmmaker to kind of pull out this cohesive narrative from all of these uh, amazing interviewees that I had a chance to sit down and talk with. And we interviewed about 20 hand-picked individuals. Joe and I went back and forth on this list for a long time. And, you know, they not only could talk about the history, but in many cases, they really were a big part of the history that we were trying to describe. They had interesting ideas about banking today. And of course, with a project like this, as, as Don knows, you have to keep it, you to keep it short, and you can only use about five or 10 minutes of each uh, long conversation. But it was, it was really inspiring for me, just as, not only as a filmmaker, but just as a person to talk to, you know, uh, sit down with a, uh, Conrad Black or a Tony Fell or, um, you know, a Paul Martin, and just talk about his concept about the past, the present, the future of banking and how it affects our society. And yet, it was really refreshing, too, because, you know, most of the people that we talked to were Canadian, or at least a large part of them were. And to see a Canadian group of people kind of talk so passionately and so proudly, not just on their own personal accolades, but just as a history and a, you know, kind of a, a community, it was very refreshing. And I thought that was wonderful. Because honestly, you know, I don't know how you feel, but sometimes I think that as Canadians, we sometimes ignore our history. And, you know, we shy away from our success which is a little bit. So a problem that our American neighbors never seem to have. <laughs> and, you know, but I, I have to say that, you know, not just after talking with Joe, but really uh, becoming part of this history community, the stories are very much here too. You know, and they have to be told. And until Canadians start telling them, they're not going to be told. And this is where I would really like to thank WNED uh, for allowing us to tell this story. Because honestly, without this one, we wouldn't have, um, I don't think anyone would see it. And it, it, they've been wonderful through the, this whole process, them and PBS. Um, and I'm so glad that we were able to deliver uh, something to them that, that, that seems like 
they really enjoy. And I really encourage all of you, if you have the time, to tune into their broadcast of our program. And we're going to be showing you a clip from it a little later on. And hopefully that will entice you further. So, thank you very much. Like many of you here, uh, I've been a big fan of WNED since uh, we first moved to Toronto and uh, been a supporter. And I was very excited uh, before 2012 to be part of the team that raised the, the funding for the War of 1812, which I thought was a first class production. more than a de decade ago. Don Boswell was then and is now an inspirational force and leader. He served for more than 20 years as president and CEO of WNED and is best described as a public broadcaster trailblazer. And he's a really nice guy who I enjoy working with. <laughs> We all know Jim Martin, and uh, he's just a special person, very talented and gifted. And so it makes it easier for somebody who's involved in content to always want to be connected and close uh, by to those individuals who have the ability to have good ideas and storytelling. And I think my first real opportunity to really get to know Jim was when we were uh, thinking about the world being fun, but it really had been something in my mind for years, knowing I was coming to Buffalo to take the job and knowing. The anniversary of the War of 1812 was coming up for its 150th year anniversary. So I had a chance to really spend some time with Joe and other Canadians, because as you mentioned, Kevin, I think good productions have to engage countries who can tell both sides of the story, and not just by one side of the story. And I'd like to tell this audience, there are a lot of gifted, bright people who have tremendous history in their backgrounds who know the history of Canada. And I think it's something that Americans need to understand and know better. That's what attracted me from leaving Dallas, Texas to come to Buffalo. Because I knew it was a border station opportunity. Because I had worked in Seattle, in KCTS in Seattle. It was a border station and I had a great relationship with Simon Fraser University. And they were the ones that were sharing a lot of these just interesting stories. And I said, you know, I'm going to become a president of the station. I want to make sure that we, especially if we're serving the Canadian side, that we Make sure we mention both cities, in this case, Buffalo, Toronto, and public media. But we also try to have, you know, and we do have offices and studio space in Toronto. But how do we work with talented individuals and current producers and producers of different uh, genres of information that could then become national programs of media? And I've been blessed. It's been a dream come true. The War of 1812, thank you for the applause and that. But that was just the beginning of programs that were really interesting to me. Um, the Klondike Gold Rush was just another fascinating program. I didn't really know much about it. Uh, that was a program that Phil Lynn had uh, shared with me again, you know, working and uh, talking to Joe and others about how could that be a story on public TV. The Underground Railroad, you may remember that program being on PBS with William Steele's Eyes about slavery. That was a Canadian story. One of my favorites are, you know, the family of the theater, uh, the Marvish, Marvish family, being able to tell that story, not only just as a local story, but as a national story. And we've done other things with Shaw and on and on and on. But the idea for me is, how do you create opportunities where you can reach out to other countries and hear their side of the story so it complements what you're trying to do in television? That's why I love this opportunity in sharing this program with you. It's not often, as you all would imagine, that a book turns into a documentary. And so it's so few of those programs that actually happen. And I have to say, Kevin, I mean, you're amazing. This is Kevin's really first production. And I know he was patient with uh, uh, Dave Robin and I because he wanted us to critique it. 
that's one thing I have to say about our, our staff. Uh, if you ask us to critique something, uh, we're not going to hold your hand. We're going to be very blunt, very open, and sometimes it's hard for people who are in the creative business. It's like walking in eggshells because you know they have a certain way they want to tell and you want to respect that. But there are things in order for, for it to be in public TV that you have to have done, to be done correctly. And Kevin was a great student of mastering exactly what was going to be needed to get this on PBS. And I remember from some of the first drafts of things. I mean, the story was there. We just sort of rough a little bit, but Kevin were religiously and reaching out, getting the big names to be a part of this. The writing of it was incredible. The storytelling of it was just amazing. It was something that was very passionate. Sylvia Bennett is one of our senior executive vice presidents of uh, development. And we were talking about driving up here. You're not going to get enough of it by seeing it here today. You're going to really watch, want to watch it all because even though I haven't seen the complete program yet, I've seen enough of it to know that uh, there should be a part two maybe, so you should be thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I, I just want to thank all of you for being here and showing your support for this program, the people behind it. And you know, Kevin, the story I want to tell you, my first uh, PBS production, uh, I, I felt great. I had 40 stations. My first one, man, I was riding the high. You're coming out with your first program with over 126, 129. <laughs> and that was not an easy task. The, the, the interesting part about PBS is that stations make their own opinions about area programs. It's not like a network that will always station from here. In this case, they had a choice of determining after watching it what they wanted. So they have 129 stations all agree it's 85% of the TV, PBS TV market in the U.S. And that's not including, like in our case, since we serve Toronto, it's not including our Toronto market audience will be watching this as well. That's why an accomplishment we should be very proud. So thank you. <laughs> and um, Joe, I have retired, but that gives me more time to work with you and your idea. <laughs> so you're on a roll. And I want to be here for all the work that you will continue to do. You know, I want our friendship to go beyond just my years at WAD. I want our friendship to be forever. And thank you for your wisdom, your insight, and your belief, and your strong commitment to history. Because it means a lot, not only for this generation, but our future generations. So thank you so much. For say that Don and I are also good friends with Red Wilson of the Wilson Foundation, and Red would have been here, but he has had an uh, important uh, medical appointment today and asked me to give you his regards. We're coming to the time for the showing, but I would just like to say to Tony and to Don and to Lynn and to Helen, well actually Helen couldn't make it because like a lot of people, we got an incredible number of calls which people couldn't make it today because they were not well. You may, you or your uh, relative, your husband or your son may not be in this particular version because these are clips. Uh, so we'll, but if you, they're not here, you can see them Monday night, 9 o'clock, WNED. <laughs> so whoever controlling the production, please turn the machines on because that's something I can do. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have any questions for our panel? Great to see that we have a federal system of banking as such, but we have trade unions as well, right? So would you touch on that part a little bit of how how this trade union evolved and because today in the bank you see uh, we, we have to adopt the federal regulations and there are provincial regulations, separate capital regulations. So, so any thoughts about that? How has how how it evolved and how do you think about it? Well I think I think the I think the big strength in Canada is just the kind of the overall start is that there is really this uh, concept that it, when you watch the full documentary and really a lot of the interviews that I picked up there's a sense of cooperation. Whereas I think in the States, um, 
they have a, a very dynamic system that I think is, works to their benefit in a lot of great ways, but it's based on competition. So it's kind of an adversarial, the regulator or the, you know, the federal government or the state government. Everyone is kind of in an adversarial, slightly situation like that. It's, whereas in Canada, it's more cooperation based. And I really think that that is kind of, you know, I think you can kind of go and, and point to different things like philosophy or, or different, uh, different major, uh, of, you know, the way that uh, province regulates certain things or uh, government's involvement. But I really think it's the fundamental, you know, the fundamental concept of, I, of the culture. But I really, I think that, that that's the biggest difference for me. Thank you. Orange? Two questions, Joe. Um, how did Hamilton's views differ from those of the families of Bank of England a hundred years earlier? Well, well secondly, how did Canada's banking system differ from that of the UK? Well, he, he drew up on what was happening in the UK, the Netherlands, which was, was very important at the time, and somehow this kid from this remote island acquired all this knowledge and was comparative knowledge. So it was, in a sense, I don't think we really thought about it when we started writing the book, is what can you learn from comparative knowledge? And certainly, I feel that I came away with a much better sense of things I could do in each country. So he was, you're absolutely right, he, it's a, a British European model to the fertile man, mind of this extraordinary individual, uh, we got what we did. And how does the Canadian system differ substantially from that in the UK? Well, it differs in the sense of, uh, I think, and uh, there's a, see, at least one former CEO of a bank here, I might ask him to comment. Uh, the, uh, there's a simple difference between a small geographic area with a lot of people and a huge country spread out all over the place. So I think if you go back to the words of Charlie Bailey, you know, Dominic Villavandro in that comment, he saw, and I, I, you know, he originally was a banker, then he wanted a CEO of manufacturers, but uh, what he saw there was that these people were in the nation builders. And they can I you know, I'm from the prairies and you, you knew that in addition to the grain elevator there was a branch bank. And that was something that was part of the fabric. And Harvey Bennett used to say if you've got a problem in one end excess assets of one and excess liabilities of another, you can match them. So uh, I would say it's not I would say it's a difference of scale, and Rick, if you want to add anything in. Well, um, I come with a very practical uh, for Canada, U.S., and the Britain. People, in my opinion, make a difference. And they especially make a difference in a crisis. And I think uh, I certainly saw it through the 2008 crisis when uh, not only do we have the, the national charter and the cultural side and all that makes a difference, uh, but unlike the United States in particular and there's some differences in, in Europe, when we had the crisis, five, six CEOs were in the room. The Minister of Finance was either in the room or represented adequately. The central banker was in the room. And the head of OSCE, the regulator, is in the room. And we could all get in the same room. And nobody got out of that room until we decided what we had to do in the crisis. And, and that was very effective. And it was good government and good regulation because we CEOs couldn't be accused of collusion, the five or six of us, you know, putting up our fees and doing this and we're trying to protect that. And if we, and we did it, he could be in front of the political side, the Minister of Finance, the Central Bank was there, and the regulator was there. 
And so I remember in one particular room right at the time of that crisis, we came up with some very fundamental principles that the five Canadians on their own couldn't make without the radio. It was a very practical thing. And, and I know the, the constitutions and bylaws and everything that are important, but when you're in a crisis, whether it be financial crisis or another crisis, execution implementation in a timely manner and in the right manner to put some safety and that really happened in 2008 a function of some of the people in the room but also the fact that we could get in the room as a simple fact we could get in the room was, i remember the most particular meeting here that is the finance department's offices and um, that did more by stabilizing the canadian system because in front of our regulator in front of our politicians, the six CEOs all looked at each other. One of the biggest problems in the crisis was liquidity. Banks wouldn't lend to each other. It was a complete, capital is important in the long run, liquidity is what saves you in the short run. And um, my particular bank was international. I was president of the International Association of Representing All Banks. And I was privileged, I guess, and then the other side, but I was in some of these broader discussion. And it was highly evident that the European banks, certainly the American banks, left on their own would not run to each other. And I said at times, in front of our regulators, are we going to lend to each other? And they went around the room and whatever, and bottom line is, we said we could lend. And we could say that because our regulators there, and that, you know, it, was, it, was, it was transparent within the, within the, within the regulatory and political process. And that was a big decision, and I think provided the interbank market in Canada survived. Yes, it's a national bank that made it easier and all these structure changes, it was a build up. But in the time of crisis, and the cultures and that were, you know, all what a good government, it's that kind of thing. And, um, but it allowed, it allowed the crisis to, to not have anywhere near the effect because of that, you know, I'm very proud of the matter of being myself, but that's that. that, 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 that We'll see, uh, you know, as you see what's going on with the financial crisis that's going around right now, what the problem is when you get in the room. You can't even get in the room, and then the rooms are so big, like the United Nations, how are we going to solve that? We've got a question over here. I, I, I would like to add a comment to that from an earlier period, the 1980s. I was part of Continental Bank of Canada, and we went through a very difficult time uh, in the 1980s. We had support from other banks, but it became clear that we needed to uh, merge with someone else. And John Turner said to the president of the uh, bank, David Lewis, he said, make it Brit and make it quick, which we did. We joined uh, Lloyds Bank which eventually then became part of uh, HSBC. So there is, a, there is a community within the banking system that can get these things done in downtown Toronto. Um, to the filmmaker and the broadcaster, perhaps, um, I was just wondering, when you shot the interviews, did you have the broadcaster already, or how did that relationship no, I, I um, we uh, shot all the interviews, um, and relatively well. Some of them, some of them, look, we shot a, a huge chunk of interviews, and then we went to go and see John with that first group, and then we collected a few more <coughs> after that. Um, we were really lucky in the fact that uh, um, there was a big event at Rodman, we put on by the CBHA actually, and uh, and there was a lot of people, that's probably why you see that annoying gray, well trodden background in, in a few of our interviews, but, but we uh, we mainly uh, just picked up most of our interviews well before we saw it and then, and then afterwards we picked up a few more based on kind of their feedback. I was wondering why you didn't have dad wear a suit. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Well, I showed up, I showed up at, your, at your family cottage and because they stay there. And, you know, Joe came down and um, I said, well, you, 
and you didn't get, you know, should we get dressed? Or, <laughs> you know, it's like, no, 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 where am I? I think that's your Icelandic yeah. teacher. I bought him that teacher. Yeah, I mean, no, this is great. This is, this is perfect. And so I just kind of went with it. I thought, you know, this is, he looks like a history professor. <laughs> and like this creative genius look, so I just wanted that. I was wondering who's playing. Any pressure from non-family members? Yeah, Daniel had a question. Um, it's a whole process when you're making a production, and um, the station, in our case, it's on record to make sure it meets all the guidelines for broadcast. Like, no conflict of interest, um, you know, especially if there's funding involved, and if there's no funder that has a sort of somebody to pay for its you know, visibility being and I think what we saw was the real storyline. Um, this being a tremendous story that had not really been told anywhere to that level. And the number of people that he was engaging to help bring that story out. And I think the fact that you know, Joe had a quote that complimented it, that gave it some you know, clearly defined guidelines of how that program was produced. And again, with you know, somebody who's talented um, as Kevin was, he really believed in the project and was willing to do whatever. We needed to make sure we get accepted and made a big deal for us to help us really progress so we could feel comfortable showing that the markets and getting their sort of sign up for their interest in that I'm not sure who this is, but I So, it, it was, and and I think also 
it seemed uh, to be the consensus that in it was the, it was kind of the difference between the banking culture and the trading culture that really uh, dictated the, the difference in Canada, where the banking culture really kept hold of things, and the United States just because of the relentless nature to compete, it seemed like the trading culture really took over. Yeah. In Canada, it was uh, the Ontario Securities Commission in 1983 that a series of hearings that allowed the investment banks to replace the first sell shares and then be acquired by the commercial banks. And just to correct about the, the, uh, the culture of uh, investment banks, CIBC is <laughs> run by an investment bank. Huh? And let's look what happened to their involvement with, uh, with Norton. And I think they had a huge civil settlement apart from the fines they paid to the uh, to the terrorist groups. Yeah, we have to be careful about saying that uh, investment banking and trading didn't have an equivalent impact on Canadian banks. No, I agree. To be honest with you, we have um, we had some really good quotes about that specifically that uh, had some Unappropriate PBS language in it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, it, it was, it was so interesting to hear you, so I'll just say that. Now, panel and audience of 645, I wanted some time for final breaking in. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, all right with everybody. We'll take a break. The bar is open, and uh, we can all talk to each other.